So one day I'm playing the Outer Wilds, and I see these two planets orbiting each other. Binary planets aren't anything weird, so I move on, and then I see the giant pillar of sand between them. Upon further investigation, I find that one planet is sucking the sand off the other one. Like any sane person, I looked at this and thought, there's no way this could happen in real life. I was wrong. As it turns out, the chances of an hourglass twin-like formation in our universe are surprisingly non-zero. My research journey began relatively simply. The hourglass twins are clearly a binary planet system, so I started my research by looking into any binary systems we know of, and if they have some form of mass transfer between them, like a giant pillar of sand. We currently know of one double planetary system, that being Pluto and Charon. Before if you say anything, I know they technically are dwarf planets, but I don't think whether or not they're dwarf planets or planets orbiting each other really matters in the grand scheme of things. The way binary systems work is that instead of one of them orbiting the other, they both orbit each other. They orbit their common center of gravity called the barycenter. In fact, all things that orbit orbit around the barycenter. When a moon is orbiting a planet, they're both orbiting their shared center of gravity, it's just that the planet is so much bigger, that center of gravity usually is the center of the planet. The general rule of thumb is, is if the barycenter is outside the surface of either of the objects, then they're probably a binary system. Pluto and Charon fit that definition. They're close enough in size that, as you can see from this little diagram, they kind of orbit this one little nebulous area in between them. Because of this, Charon doesn't orbit Pluto, instead they orbit each other. Now that I've gotten the binary system spiel all the way, let's get to the good part. Do Pluto and Charon have a giant sand pillar between them? As it turns out, surprisingly, no. That being said, they do exchange materials semi-actively. Pluto's weak gravity means that its atmosphere is constantly leaking out into space, Sharon, being a nearby source of gravity, ends up gobbling a not insignificant amount of that escaped gas. In fact, the red splotch on Sharon is more or less just a bunch of Pluto's escaped atmosphere. So we do know that binary planets can take mass from each other, but this didn't really satisfy me. Sharon absorbing trace amounts of Pluto's atmosphere is not the same as a giant sand pillar, so I had to keep digging. So where in the universe do we go to find binary systems that have massive amount of materials transferring between them? Well, those of you who know anything about space probably already knew where this was going. So let's talk about stars. If there's one type of binary object that we have actually studied to an extreme degree, it would be stars. Binary star systems are relatively common and understood, to the point where some people think that the sun might have had a binary partner at some point. Binary stars come in many shapes and sizes, but the ones we are interested in currently are the ones that have some kind of active mass transfer between the two. Stars like that are much closer to the hourglass twins than planets. As you can see, both stars are orbiting each other, but one of them is sucking a pillar of matter from the other one. Over long timescales, this will result in one star getting smaller while the other star gets slowly bigger, very similar to what happens with the hourglass twins. The mechanics for which systems have mass transfer and which systems don't are quite complex. The most important thing to understand is this concept called a Roche lobe. The Roche lobe is the area in which a star can exist and still have a gravitational hold on all its matter. If its physical size is past the lobe, it can no longer hold on to those outer layers. Normally, this isn't much of a problem, because if the star is the only thing around, it's not like the layers are going to go anywhere, they're just going to get pulled back in eventually. But, if it has a binary partner, then anything past that Roche lobe are going to get pulled in by the partner. The Roche lobe and the math around it seemed like a great way to find two planets that would act like the Ash Twins. One problem though, the math for the Roche lobe is designed for stars and gas, not for two planets and a pillar of sand. The second problem with this is I suck at math, and thus even though I have all the formulas, I can do exactly nothing with them. There's also the small issue that the Ash Twins switch which one has sand on it on a regular basis. In game, the sand only goes from the Ash Twin to the Ember Twin, and this is for gameplay reasons and for certain puzzles. But in the lore, they apparently switch back and forth on a regular basis. Thankfully, this last problem was the first one I found an answer to. As it turns out, some binary star systems also can switch back and forth. The star absorbing the matter can grow past its Roche limit, and thus, the star that was shrinking this whole time could start sucking all the matter back. So now back to the main issue. Calculating the Roche lobe between two planets transferring sand is a difficult task. I think I might be the first person to ever try this. But there is some hope. There is a thing called a Roche limit, which sounds similar but is very different. It is how close a smaller object can get to a bigger object before it collapses because of the gravitational pull from said bigger object. The Roche limit and lobe are two different things, 
but they are close enough and have enough crossover that you can kind of work out one by using the other. And as it turns out, calculating the Roche limit for asteroids is quite common. You may be wondering why this is important. Well, many asteroids are made of loosely packed rocks and gravel, so for all intents and purposes, they're made of a sand-like substance. So, the math for them is actually based around something I can use. Because I can use the math calculating for the gravelly asteroids to calculate for sand. It's not perfect, but it's a start. The fact we are working with sand is kind of a blessing and a curse. On one hand, calculating the roche lobe interaction for sand is a brand new discipline never before tried by science. On the other hand, sand can behave like a liquid and even sort of like a gas due to its granular nature. What we need to determine is the following. Does the sand make the ash twin so much bigger that it extends past its Roche lobe despite any gravity the sand adds? The main thing we need to find to determine the Roche lobe of two objects is their gravity. Using their gravity, we can find their Lagrange points and thus their Roche lobe. Now you might be wondering, what's a Lagrange point? Lagrange points are areas around any two objects where their relative gravities cancel out. So for example, the Earth and the Sun have five Lagrange points, and at all of those spots, the Earth and the Sun's gravity are at equal strengths. Because the gravities cancel out, any object within a Lagrange point kind of stays in the same area relative to the two objects. For example, we put the James Webb Space Telescope at one of the Lagrange points of the Earth and the Sun. This way, it stays in the same relative position compared to the Earth and can easily communicate with satellites in certain dishes. But back to the hourglass twins. We just need to find their L1 Lagrange point, which is basically the point that is between two objects. All the other ones are either to the sides or behind them. Well, I started doing all this work to calculate the gravities of both planets and then their Lagrange points and then find the Roche lobe using math. And then it turns out I didn't need to do any of that. Half of the script it means nothing in retrospect, because all I needed to do was land on each planet, because in the corner of your HUD in the game, it just says how much gravity a planet has. Once again, my immense intelligence is on display for all to see. I have played literally dozens of hours of the Outer Wilds, and I never once noticed that there's a gravity counter in the corner. And then things got even easier because both planets have roughly the same gravity, which means their first Lagrange point would be probably smack dab in the middle. And, well, that's not a good thing for this theory, because as it turns out, if it's right in the middle, that is way past where all the sand is, regardless of which planet it's on. So no, the Hourglass Twins are not actually fully realistic. I know, that's shocking. But that does leave me with one question. What do I have to do to create a binary system that at least superficially mimics the Hourglass Twins? How can I make two planets that orbit each other where one is sucking matter off the other, just like when it's two stars? Well, for starters, I need two planets, and they have to be very specific types of planets. We need one planet that has so much atmosphere that its gravity cannot hold on to it all the way, and then we need another planet that's just big enough that it can suck away that atmosphere. That immediately limits the amount of planets we can use. For the one with the atmosphere, we can't use something like a gas giant or an ice giant, because those guys are big enough that they can hold on to all their mass. But I was able to find one type of planet that might work. It's called a super puff. Super puffs are Earth-sized planets with so much atmosphere that they appear to be the size of Neptune. Such planets, as you might guess, do not have a very strong hold on their outer atmosphere. So, they are the perfect candidate for what we're trying to do. And then, all the other planet has to be is something with a similar size or mass to the first planet. So another Earth-sized planet orbiting at a respectable distance, just far enough that they have a stable orbit, but just close enough that it can grab up anything that passes the first planet's Roche lobe. Now, I'm not smart enough to know the exact specifics of what these planets would have to look like to make this system work. I am just giving a rough outline. But I think for the most part, it would do the same thing as the Ash Twins. Maybe not the whole, they switch which one has the sand part. Who even knows? That's even more uncharted territory. So are the Hourglass Twins realistic? Of course not. They're from a game where you can walk across the planet in like five minutes. But the setup of two planets orbiting each other with a pillar of sand between them, the chances are surprisingly non-zero. So maybe 
somewhere out there, there's a little blue alien trying to get their way out of a time loop. I'll see you next time. So that's about it for this video. It's a little bit shorter than my Iron Lung one, but I'm still trying to figure out what my ideal content length is, especially for you weirdos on YouTube. If you made it this far, like and subscribe. And also, I'm wondering if I should make a Patreon. So if you have made it this far, leave a comment and say if you want me to make a Patreon or not. I don't know what I'd put on there, but I'm still trying to gauge how this whole being an internet person works. So yeah, see ya.